Hi everyone, and welcome to Your Sexified Life. In case we haven't met yet, I'm Fanny, your pleasure coach and creatrix of Sexified. In this podcast, we discuss what makes being alive sexy. Pleasure, orgasms, body reconnection, self-evolution, emotions, everything we need to reclaim the thriving sex and fulfilling life we deserve. With a zero bullshit tolerance also. And most of all, we take the commitment to feel alive because we only have one life and it's time to live it. Because being alive is sexy. Welcome to your sexified life. Just a heads up before we start this episode, letting you know that I had to cut it in half because I had a lot of things to say and it ended up really being way too long. So I cut it in half. You will have the next part, the part, second part next week, just so that it stays, it stays around 30 minutes or so to be more accessible in our busy daily life. Thank you for tuning in. Hello, sexy family. Today, I wanted to talk about something really important. What I consider a prelude to any thriving sex and fulfilling life you want, whatever shape or form it, it has for you. And that's consent, especially self-consent. Consent is getting closer each day to the place it's meant to be, which is at the center of every single sexual interaction. But I also wanted to address something that is maybe not so well known, and that's self-consent. And how actually not respecting it, and maybe not being aware of it, can actually be really detrimental to your sex life. But let's talk about consent first. When we think about consent first and foremost, it's about an interaction between two or more people. And simply put, consent is yes. Or yes, please go for it, I want that. You see my point. And nothing else. Things like, yeah, but meh, I should, I have to, the person will be mad if I don't, or it's been a long time. This is not consent. There is no half consent. That doesn't exist. What can exist is a true maybe. We'll talk about that in a minute. And of course, no, it's not about not being consensual. It's about abuse, except in a consensual, chosen, kinky relationship. But you get the idea. Yes. Or, yes, please, go for it, I want it. One of the rule of thumbs with consent is to never assume it's there when you want to initiate spring mode. If you remember the last episode, spring mode is about building the turn on, the electricity in the air when, you're, when you build pleasure. So never assume consent is there by default. Even if you have been in this relationship for a while or knowing this or these partners for a while, even if usually it's a yes, just check and maybe find several ways to ask. Can I? Do you want me to? Is that okay? If I want to do X, what do you think about it? I love to. Are you up for it? Because sometimes things can be pleasurable and sometimes not, depending on depending on your level of arousal, your cycle and everything. And also knowing you can ask permission without words and just with a pause. We'll talk about that in a minute. So you might be wondering, am I really going to ask my partner every time I want to touch them? Maybe yes, because some people react strongly to unrequested touch. So be sure to check that first. But otherwise, I would invite you to consider the difference between winter touch and spring touch. Like the difference between, hey, you just awake, wanna bang, let me grab your breasts, versus, hey, you just awake, let me touch your shoulder first, slowly, and then increase pressure, pausing before going down, just so that you have the time to give me a yes or a no. That's the difference between the spring touch and winter touch. We could also also argue the example I just gave is more of a disrespectful dumbass than true spring. But spring as in, let's go and touch your breasts. So winter touch is the one that is slowly build, awakening the body, whereas spring touch is building the turn on. 
I stand by checking in and checking, con getting consent before every type of touch. But if you want to initiate something, for example, if your partner is just slowly awaken awakening or something, be sure to do only winter touch when you have not asked for consent yet. Ask consent before going into spring mode, definitely. We'll talk about nonverbal consent in a minute, but I just wanted to address something first about sometime consent being leaving time, some time and some space and waiting for an invitation to go forward. And if you do not get the affirmative answer or invitation to go forward, then you don't go. It is really common for us to just make a pause, checking there is no reject reaction, like you know you're not doing that or no, I don't want that, and go forward instead of using that pause, keeping that pause as long as the time you need to get an answer, whether it's a yes or a no. If that is what you have been seeing in your sexual behaviors, be kind to yourself. We don't learn those type of things. There is a little, really little chance that someone has ever explained to you, pause and pause and pause until you get a yes or a no. What is What happens usually is we pause and when we don't see a no, then we go forward and assume constant is there, which is a really different type of things if you ask me. So consent is giving time and proceeding only when you got the yes. Hint, it might require a little bit of work at the beginning, especially since, especially if you have been in a relationship with a lot of default patterns, just checking in with your loved ones saying, hey, can I get the time to actually say if I want a yes or a no, Defining, redefining together what real consent is is, can actually be truly helpful and healing. Some would argue that the consent thing is getting weird in the kinky relationships, in kinky sexy times. I would argue that the kink play, as long as it is in a healthy way and not in abusive ways, because if it's, if it's abuse, it's not kink, it's abuse. This is one of the most consensual ways of playing, and we should definitely learn a lot from it. In a kinky time, you check before, and consent is checked at every moment because the submissive has the safe word. So at any moment, the submissive can check with themselves if they are ready to go forward or if they need to back off. And Actually checking in with yourself at every moment if you are still a yes for what's happening is the ultimate form of consent and respecting yourself. We definitely need more of that, allowing ourselves to stop any sexy time or type of interaction if it, if it doesn't feel right or that's not what we want. So maybe, yeah, somehow kinky relationship or kinky sexy times are the most consensual at all. And that's not maybe. <laughs> that being said, let's talk about nonverbal consent. Because sometimes consent can be just a smile or an invitation to go forward with a nod or any type of nonverbal interaction you have agreed with your partner or partners previously, a type of smile, a wink, or anything that can happen that you have decided together. But two, drink, two tricks can actually happen with nonverbal consent. First, it's really easy to overlook it because it's way harder to notice than hearing a yes or a no. And also, when you are in a long-term relationship where patterns haven't been have been running <laughs> running on for a long time without getting an update then you may consider a pattern that you previously agreed on as always valid and still valid and go forward without checking it that's why i often offer even in long time in long time relationships just a regular check-in a regular verbal can I 
do you want? Do you still like? And when you think about it, isn't that even sexier? Actually, having you and your partner or partners getting back into the, hey, let me check. I really want that. Let me check. It really feels good. Never assume consent is there, even if usually it is there. And as I said before, actually restoring space and time for real consent in a long-term relationship is a great step to recreate intimacy and heal, heal your relationship and heal yourself. Asking the question actually allows the time to think and answer. And the person in front of you can take some time to really feel if they want this. It gives them the space to say a no if there is a no. It's way easier to say no when you have, when you have been asked permission. Way easier than finding a no when something you're not sure to you even wanted has already started. I like to think about this as a gym metaphor. When you go to the gym, you have the choice to look around when you arrive and you can decide if you're in a mood for a good sweat and exhaust yourself in weightlifting because it makes you feel good or if you want to have a metal practice because you don't want to push yourself or you don't want to do any weightlifting at all and prefer stretching. Deciding it at the beginning of your session when you haven't started anything yet actually requires less energy than you being on your bench under 20 kilograms of weight, being like, oh, I am not even sure this is what I want to do. And oh no, I'm under my 20 kilograms and I want to do stretch. Let me push that 20 kilograms so that I can finally do what you want. See my point about the energy lost? <laughs> so doing a check-in before checking... Doing a check-in as checking in with the constant actually allows the energy to be only focused in what feels good in during the interaction instead of having some energy running in the background. Do I really want that? Am I really sure I want this? I wish I could do something else. Blah, 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 blah. Just as we already touched upon, asking the question and be willing to listen to the answers is one of the quickest ways to heal a lot of things, your relationship, but also yourself. Because when you give space and honor to the answer, you create safety. And that safety can be useful in your relationship and in the relationship with yourself. Think back when you had a great, deep, transformational and powerful conversation with someone. Was it a really fa fast bouncing from one topic to the next conversation? Maybe it was, but most of the time, these types of conversation, at least for me, they come with two people having time and space and being really, really ready to listen to each other, give each other the space to process. And when you give yourself space and time, you do the same. You're doing deep and transformational and powerful work with yourself. What I noticed is that this gym metaphor actually applies to the concept of true winter and sad winter we discussed in our previous episode. As you may or may not remember, our sexual cycle is made of four seasons, spring with turn on, summer with orgasm, fall when things release, and winter, winter when we rejuvenate. With the trick of true winter, as in I need to rejuvenate, and sad winter, as in I'm dissociating and abandoning myself so that I don't feel anything, and especially not what I have been avoiding feeling for a lot of time. So we can continue on the gym metaphor about the feeling of I don't want to work today. If you go to the gym and feel I don't want to work today, The offering I have is looking for, is it a real need for rejuvenation? If you've run a marathon yesterday, of course you're not gonna, you are not going to run another one today. Definitely not. That's true winter. And there is the tricky, I don't want to work. Maybe it comes with anger. I've worked and half. I don't want to work anymore. Work out anymore or work, whatever. Screw you, screw everybody and leave me alone or it comes with your mind racing. 
I don't want to work. But if I don't want, if I don't, what if I don't want to work out? Wow, that was hard to say. <laughs> what if I don't want to work out ever again? Like no weightlifting ever or anything. What if, what if I don't want to put any effort in anything after that? What if I want to relish into pleasure and never work out again? When you think about it, either from anger or from mind racing, this type of winter comes from a chatty mind. And usually, winter coming from a chatty mind is not really the true winter, more of a sad winter. The idea here is, in true winter, you will just need to rejuvenate. If you stayed up all night because you were at a great party or watching the Super Bowl or whatever, you just go to sleep. Whereas in sad winter, resting would actually come with all that we have been avoiding to feel coming up to the surface. Maybe it's grief because you had a lot of efforts, you put a lot of efforts in something and it's not working. Or maybe it's anger because you bought the school college hyping job, um, marriage house as the recipe for happiness and you're even more <laughs> madder at yourself that you bought that kind of stuff. So that's dissociation. We don't press pause because we're afraid of what's under and that's sad winter and it can be really scary. And that dissociation can actually happen in your sexual interaction. When you feel a no, is it a really no, I don't want that? Or is it a no, because I don't feel anything? Watch out. In every situation, a no is to be respected. And it can also be a source of inquiry. Noticing. Am I connected to myself? Am I checking in with myself? And is it a real no? Or is it a no because I feel disconnected and because I'm super scared that the rage I have inside will burn my whole world if I let it out or that I would drop my whole life because I'm so sad inside and I have been sad for a long, long time. Or any emotion that is that has been hiding, hiding in sad winter. It is actually very common to bury this dissociation under a default pattern that usually does not require you really checking in with yourself, like going to the gym and go for weightlifting as a default pattern. I go to the gym, I do weightlifting, and or a pattern of chatty mind, either anger or being afraid of not wanting to work out anymore again, ever, like ever, never. This gym metaphor has been going for way too long and I still have some things to say. I'm sorry. <laughs> but if you notice that when you go to the gym and you actually listen to what you want to do, maybe you want the 20 kilograms or maybe you just want 10 and you want 10 minutes on the treadmill or maybe, maybe after the 10 and 10, you will feel super great and you actually want to do the weightlifting of 20 kilograms. So do you see where I'm going here? If you leave the opportunities open, if you ask for consent, then you can have a more adjusted practice and you and your partners can actually have a great time that feels aligned at the moment. And you might even get what you wanted originally after a small detour. Or you might get something even better. Isn't that amazing? Now that the gym metaphor is done, I have one last thing to say about that. It is how, and I'm going to call out a lot of us, me including me included on that, is how actually asking for, cons for consent is a very good way to notice if we really want to give something to our partner or partners because they will enjoy it, or if we want to give them something that we would actually need. We've all been there. Giving our partner a type of touch which we crave or a type of hug or whatever. And we don't understand why we're not getting that because we're giving them the info. We're doing it to them. Why are they, or why are they not understanding? Raise your hand if if that happens way more often than you are um, ready to, to admit. But 
Allowing this pause, this checking in for consent, helps you notice that. Is it really for my partner, partners, or is it a message that I want to get through? No judgment if you do that. Be kind to yourself. <laughs> I think we all do. I know it can be really frustrating to look for consent as often as you can, but I'd love to offer a reframe on that. Isn't this even sexier? Like when you are into in sexual interaction together, you are both a hundred or a hundred and fifty person in full in and do something that both of you really like and are enjoying giving each other the maximum of pleasure, which is really nice, isn't it? So we discussed what consent is, how to look for it. We had a gym metaphor that went up for way too long and actually explaining how checking more often with consent and never assume it's there is really beneficial, more beneficial than you think for a lot of things. There is something else we need to address. We said there is no such thing as half consent. All of the crap of oh, I should or I need to because that person will be mad or blah, blah, blah. This is not consent. And at the same time, it can happen. You're like, I'm not totally a yes, but I'm not totally a no. So I guess it's a, a maybe. Let's talk about maybe. First things first, what is a true maybe? Personally, I like to think of maybe as a little cat slowly emerging from its nap yawning, stretching, slowly opening the eyes, you know, not really totally asleep, not fully awakened yet, the no being asleep and the yes being awakened, just to explain that metaphor. And what is actually not helping a cat slowly emerging from a nap is getting yelled at by someone saying, you should wake up right now and be ready. Or you've taken a nap for too long already, get up. Or we haven't gone for a walk together, so you need to get out of your nap right now and get some exercise done and blah, 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 blah. You know, that kind of crap I mentioned earlier, but towards a cat. Doing something after your cat have been yelled at and or, and, or have been asked really heavily and often to do something, please, 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 please. This is not honoring the cat's physiological rhythm and the cat's time to awake from a nap, isn't it? So when you're not sure in a check-in consent situation, tune into yourself and see. If you don't feel a yes for getting into your spring mode, is it because it is a no or is it because there is a true maybe, like maybe or maybe not? Or is it a no that I, I am actually not listening to because I'm convincing myself it's a maybe so I should go on and push through? Sometimes we have surprises when we start actually really tuning in. Maybe needs time, patience and exploration. Not someone yelling, please say yes, please say yes, please say yes. Or why are you asleep in the first place? Shouldn't you be awake and playing like you always do? Maybe needs time and questions. Imagine you're on a date. If the person is hesitant during a conversation because a vulnerable topic came up, what would you do to make this person comfortable? Maybe you would slow down the conversation Ask that person if she wants to say more or if she wants to change the topic. Maybe you definitely wouldn't be like, why are you feeling bad? Why don't you want to tell me why you're feeling bad? I can see you feel bad. Don't pretend you don't feel bad. Have you tried this and this and this solution to make all your problems disappear? Even if I'm just a stranger and I've heard about your problems for two seconds, let's go straight to the root of the root cause of all your issues right now. Even if I'm a total stranger, blah, 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 blah. You see what I mean? Exploring that in this way isn't the most efficient and also trust-building <laughs> situation. So when there is a maybe, call back that metaphor. What would you do 
if you were in a conversation with someone on a vulnerable topic, first, maybe you would offer to either continue or change topic. And if that person wants to continue, then maybe asking question with genuine interest and allowing the person to share what's comfortable. Offering option and listening to the answer when someone is in a vulnerable place is always a good idea. And when you think about it, igniting spring in a sexy time can be pretty vulnerable. With a lot of things and a lot of shit might come up. Judgments, fears, ancient history, etc. So yes, igniting spring is vulnerable for a lot of people. And this is something we need to integrate in our relationships. Igniting spring is a vulnerable moment. And in there, we need to go slowly to awaken the sleepy cat if it wants to take to come out of the nap and ask for consent. Same as what you would do when you wanted to go deeper into a vulnerable conversation. Turned out, approaching these vulnerable situations with time, space, and patience is also something we can apply to ourselves, especially around our sexuality. If you're not familiar with touching yourself, you can read a book or an article or listen to an episode that says do this and do this and do this in this order to actually have an amazing sex life. Personally, I don't believe in all of that because if, as if someone could actually have any idea what is exactly true for you. If so, why do we have so many problems and so much shit in our world? But that being said, <laughs> it's more of a question to take the information, give yourself the time and space to explore. That's one of the root of the self-consent we're going to talk in the next episode. But sidetrack, the content I actually consider the best is the content that is empowering you where you actually get the tools to self-study and explore what feels true to you at that moment. And when you think about it, doing an inquiry on your maybe is a kind of a really big deal of empowerment. You step out of the yes, no, and shit in the middle, and you start to explore your maybe. Because if you explore your maybe, Then you find a yes, then that's full consent from a fully powerful yes. And if you explore your maybe and find a no, that's a real no too, from a true place of power. Because you gave yourself the time to say yes or no to arrive to what feels real and true. A saying goes, consent is the new sexy. I'd rather offer empowered consent is even sexier. That's just my opinion. We just shared that maybe actually needs times and questions. And the thing that comes with asking questions is actually understanding the answers. That's the base of self-consent. And we will discuss that in our next episode. Talk about a teasing. As usual, if you found this episode interesting, feel free to share it with a loved one and on your favorite social media and subscribe to the podcast. It always warms my heart to know we're more and more people joining the sexy family. If you want to support the show, you can leave a review to help the spreading the sexified magic and help more people discover the sexified life. On Apple Podcasts, scroll down the show's page and select a star rating and tap on write a review. And on Spotify, select the star rating on the show's page. Thank you so much for listening to this episode and I'll see you soon. Until next time, stay sexy.